deficient that they are, are or might be neglecting. Desiree? Your own problem, your issue of the um, the state deficit, um, the What about problems like the deficit or the drug problem? Do they have a special interest group behind them? Sorry. No, they don't. And that's why government doesn't give them money. Well, why is that of critical importance to this headline? Is government dead? Evan. Because the government doesn't want to face the big issue like the deficit because no special interest group support them. Therefore, if they send their attention to the real important issues, they won't get elected the next time around. Or they feel an excellent insight, Danny. I think that uh, the politicians, they're all, they don't concern the, the big issues like the deficit. They just want to maintain their power. And if they don't, they, they keep taking money and the, and the debt is getting bigger and bigger. $206 billion, the real deficit is estimated by it's time. But wait a second, didn't President Bush declare a war on drugs in September of this year? Doesn't that at least prove a degree of addressing the major problems in our society, Rolando? Yeah, he did, but that wasn't enough for the problems we were facing in this country. Yeah, drugs. Excellent insight. And for that matter, Gina? Excellent. Evan? You just gave enough to please the special groups just to say, well, I'm putting my effort. I'm doing it for you. But really, that it's not enough. To Almost do. a kind of cosmetic government to address itself to the cosmetics of the drug war, but not nearly enough to, to fight a drug industry which is worth on the average of $100 billion a year, bigger than General Motors. And I think he's, he, gave, he gave $2 billion. And that's, that's nothing because... He just wants to show that he's a good president and he addresses all the issues and gives money to them and, he, and he's good. That's what I meant. He should be That's what I meant, Danny, by president. cosmetic presence. Cosmetic, in other words, only on the surface of the near. John? Um, well, um, they want to, well, the president and all the other people, they want to stay in power. So, so what they do is they just spread. They don't go out on their own and really do something about the real problems. They just, like, spread their Excellent. Does this remind you in any direct or indirect way to situations we discussed in the fall of the Roman Empire from the 2nd century AD after the Pax Romana to the 5th century AD? Jason? In the 5th century AD, um, there are only bureaucracy inside the government. By, by they, who do you mean in Rome? The government. By the emperors and the army specifically. Right. Go they ahead. They want to see who's going to become the next emperor. They want, and this is while the German tribe, the army, they were coming in, they were coming into the cities and destroying all the cities. And all they were concerned is who's going to be the emperor. So then what is the historical parallel, if any, between the United States and the Roman government on failure to meet critical national interests in a time of crisis, Evan? Both during the time of crisis failed to meet the big issues. There was sort of an apathy between the government and both of them. They didn't want to look the main issues in the eye. They just went to live with what was, what was the bureaucracy seemingly interested in, both in the Roman army and the government, as well as in our Congress and in the office of the president? Desiree? They were interested in keeping the power. They would stay above everything, no matter how steep and serious the problems got. Another excellent, very excellent point. In other words, when we use the word like paralysis, or Time Magazine uses it, or a word like immobilized, something should come to mind from our discussions on bureaucracy. Is any, does anything we have said on the issue of bureaucracy in complex societies help us to understand why government, when it becomes so complex, is reduced to paralysis and immobilization. Yeah, John? Because um, the bureaucracy forms 
is already solved the problems and it's already um, things that people have to do to do something, that their space to move is limited, so they're kind of paralyzed and they're not able to do anything. Or as, one, as something the Time Magazine article said, the politicians, whether in Rome or the United States, are limited by their short-sightedness. What does that mean? Their short-sightedness. Jason? They don't see, they can't face the whole issue. They can only see, like, the surface of it. They won't go beyond that to try to, to try to solve it, or to try to make the problem easier. Okay, sorry? They don't feel they, they care about the problem. They're just working there. They will never go beyond the red tape. Aha! In other words, caught into inertia, driven into inertia by their own red tape. I'll be very honest with you. Had I had the wisdom and insight of the authors of Time Magazine, I would have integrated this concept as an historical parallel in the poem I asked you to analyze and read for homework. Would you please take it out when the Roman legions left? Unfortunately, I didn't have the insight at the time I was writing this poem, but had I had it, I certainly would have included it in this poem. I'm going to take the poet's prerogative and read it first before we analyze it and dissect it and cut it up into ribbons. Okay, when the Roman legions left. When the Roman legions came our way, there was little thought that over time we come to welcome them at dusk. When barbarian and bandit moved menacingly, like shadows in our city parks and streets today, feudalize us into security apartments. Hostages of circumstance, paying highest rents to scan the city skyline without a thought of going out till dawn. The roads are cut in disrepair, and gentle folk seldom travel far. The businesses have moved away, and only those with high connections can take care of necessities. The taxes rise beyond our means, and the daily papers fill with news of political corruption. The leaders of the morning stand indicted or dishonored before evening. And all the while, our police move motionless through careless routines, while keeping distance from the crimes and immune to the suffering of the victims we have all become. Only those who sleep behind the scenes in bulletproof Mercedes with cannons in their coats, can ride the land like lords and kill with such impunity that those of us who grovel in our holes look to them to set up laws of a kind we've never known when the Roman legions came our way. A poet friend of mine, John Solos of Harvard University, read this poem last week. It's about a year old poem, he read it last week. And he commented that it was really two poems in one. Two poems in one. What do you think he meant? John? That, that the poem is trying um, in a kind of obscure way to form a parallel. Hopefully not in an obscure way, but go ahead. Between, uh, <laughs> not uh, okay. between um, the Roman times and uh, how it is today in modern years. Very good. The poem, by establishing an historical parallel, attempts to do that, just that. Evan? It sure tries to tie in how they were saved and then how things have come about about by the changes in society. All right, in the first four lines, I make reference to the Roman legions. How can I when we don't have Roman legions? Obviously, there are many dissimilarities in an historical parallel that we've discussed. It's not all a simulation, an exact replica of Rome and the United States. There are many dissimilarities. Why does, how does the poet use the idea of Roman legions symbolize justice, peace, Right. When in the Roman Empire? Oxymoron. Excellent. And in a sense, this is a kind of why? Why is it a kind of nostalgia? Then. Because um, the main quote is trying to say that today society is declining, and uh, the people who have con conquered some of these nationalities, they say that when the Romans legions left, they, they were left with nothing. And all the peace left and injustice and money. Which and helps to explain and... why the sub, very good then, which helps to explain why the subject nationalities were so enamored by the Roman Empire. They Latinized their culture. They assimilated Roman ideals. Exactly. But when they when they left, they were in the, in the dusk. The, the, 
Dusk is symbolic of what? Darkness. Darkness, beginning to lead into the dark ages, the feudal period. Okay, let's take this from the top. Uh, Desiree, would you like to read? I'm going to interrupt you, so I want you all to participate. As we read this, I would like you to keep one major question in mind. We said that this is a poem about victims. And I asked you in your homework question to delineate what experiences in your life are similar, living in New York City today, are similar to the ideas in this poem. Please feel free to raise your hand as Desiree reads this, and we can begin to analyze it. Go ahead, Desiree. From the moment you just came over, there was little City. 
And I use that as a prime example of this localization of life. What do you think the impact would be of many generations living in a kind of localized security building situation that John and, and Glenn have discussed? What do you think the impact would be? Yeah, for a They will never know how the outside world is. They don't know what would it grow. All right, what, what characteristics might they begin to develop that, as, as urban dwellers, as city dwellers, is the very opposite is the very opposite of being urbane. It's interesting that the word urbane means sophisticated, polished, worldly. And what word do you see in urbane? Urban. Urban, excellent. The word city. But we have Words like parochial and provincial. Uh, does anyone know what they mean? Parochial, provincial. So well, private, on a smaller scale, kind of narrow, narrow. Um, maybe one dimensional, limited. Like some people would allege, a city person might allege that a country person is like the country mouse, a country bumpkin. What image do you get of the country bumpkin? He's not what? Like he doesn't belong to anything. He's just, he's just in his own world. Right, right. He's not half the things around him. He's not sophisticated. He's not worldly. He's rather narrow and one-dimensional and limited. All right, I think that we're going to see, as we discussed the feudal age and the early Middle Ages, that this is primarily the, one of the major reasons the Middle Ages turns out looking the way it does. Rather provincial, rather parochial, rather one-dimensional. Okay, let's take it from there. Ed, you want to read, please? Utilize us in security departments, hostages of circumstance. What does that mean, hostages of circumstance? Cool. Raphael? People are afraid to leave their homes or their neighborhood because they're afraid that if they leave their neighborhood, someone's someone from some other neighborhood is going to try to um, hurt them, harm them, or something. Or that may well be, but what is the hostage of circumstance? Allegra. You said, like, they know that they can't get any help from the police, and they can't get so they feel trapped in the home. Okay, excellent. Ed? Because of, of the society and with all the localization of things that people live in, they feel trapped and alienated because they don't feel that they can leave there. Can they put their finger on the cause? Can they delineate the cause, Gina? Excellent. That is, what I want you to begin to see, and I think you are seeing it, is this is a rather complex scenario. This is a complex cycle. It is very difficult to pinpoint the exact cause of one's ennui, one's worry. In French, ennui, one's worry. Okay, go ahead. A highest risk to scan the city, the city skyline. What irony is being established here, John? Now, you're paying so much money to look out at the beautiful city and you can't even go out on foot to see it. Right, oh. yes, then. I think you are trying to say that we pay, we pay more money to be a hostage. hostage yeah, that's a very good. I didn't even think of that, but that's definitely another, uh, that's another measure of the irony that you're paying to be a hostage. A well-kept hostage, if you're in a, a high-paying security building. Go ahead. The roads are cut in despair, and general folks seem seldom travel far. You know, I have to interrupt. I was listening to WNEW on the radio this morning. And the MTA, Mass Transit, has a commercial. I don't know how many people heard it. And it says, the graffiti has left the subways. You know, the graffiti-proof cars now? Come ride the subways. Join us once again. And my heart dropped. I realized that this fit directly into the lesson. Why is the MTA giving a commercial like that? Please join us again. The graffiti has left the trains. Why are they urging New Yorkers to ride the trains again? As if they stopped? Did they stop? Uh, when they had other stuff like that, you know, they had no control over the people and other sides of the or they would have us believe that if they corrected the graffiti, what is true of the other more critical problems like crime that face people in the cars? Gina? Do you buy it? No. Why not? Because they don't 
You're a living example of the cycle of the climate. They're looking enough for it. They tend to overlook it and see the little, 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 not important, not important issues that they tend to deal with. You mean graffiti's not important? No, it's not that important. Who cares about graffiti on the thing? The fire's going around, you can get mugged. But isn't it, isn't it that what John intimated that they want you to believe that the graffiti led to the crime? Leads to crime. Aha, uh -huh. maybe not necessarily. Very good. Yes, yes. They're attacking a small little issue. You know graffiti was wrong, but they're mm -hmm. attacking a small issue and they're leading you to believe that they solved the big issues. Beautifully put. Very, oh wow. This is very, very well put. All right, yes, hey, Jason. I have to say, I'd rather ride a car filled with graffiti and have a guarantee of not getting mugged or robbed, but they're not saying that. This, the, getting rid of all the graffiti, but they still haven't done anything about the crime. They'll or not enough. They'll assign me a few transit officers to be on the trains, and they only protect, they, they, like you said, they protect the property before they protect you. That's very interesting. Yeah, Glenn? Instead, they'll put maybe hundreds of policemen just watching the trains when they're sitting at rest. But when the trains are moving on the subway, there's only going to be a couple of cops to watch out that nothing happens to the people. You're so cynical, people. You're right in, right in the I cycle mean, of the clock. I, yeah, I'm sorry, but I mean, I mean that every day we hear people getting shot. A, a bunch of kids attack one person, shot dead in two, in two shots. So if they think that, you know, it's more safe to ride the subway just because it's clean, they don't understand. It's what's inside the train that happens. So then I think many of you see beyond the, that surface issue. Desiree? Yeah, I'm trying to somebody who was not wise to what happened.
politics, which in turn creates a situation of po potential political violence. Remember, from 255 to 285 AD, 17 Roman emperors were assassinated in 30 years. We experienced the assassinations in the 60s of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, president, RFK as a senator running for president, and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. This creates an atmosphere of political violence which in turn feeds on the decay of the police. So that it's a cyclical kind of thing. Go ahead. And all the while, our police move motionless. Through careless routine. What does that mean? Our police move motionless. Denise? Through careless routines. Okay. Teresa? Beyond 
it's interesting that a congressman in Bushwick, in Brooklyn, said that the only way that streets can be won over from the drug lords, like the nobility, well, heck, they're not noble, but they're certainly like the lord nobility, was by bringing in the national guard. What was he trying to say? Well, how, what situation is he trying to show, John? That you have to, that you have to bring in an army to fight, to fight an army. Exactly. Exactly. All right, I want to ask you something. When I originally sent this poem out to be published, because every poet wants to get his poetry published, I had a lot of difficulty with this particular poem. And one editor in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, who I spoke to on the phone, said to me, look, Mr. Siegelman, it's a great poem. I really like it, but the American reading public is not ready for it. What did he mean? Why are we not conditioned to think of these historical parallels with the Roman Empire and ourselves. Jason? Because what we don't want to know that we're our great clients. That, that's not what we want to hear. We want to hear that we're powerful, that we're a great country. Could you expand on that? That's excellent. Uh, Evan? Well, it, it shows so many parallels between the Roman Empire and our, that, and our empire. It deals with our whole feeling of ethnocentrism. Excellent. We did this earlier in the term. Just for a moment, what does ethnocentric mean? Only two feet, Jason. No, thinking that you're the best and you're, you're like the center of all things. Gina? But the United States and that to believe that way books, if people talk so high about the United States, but they tend to have blinders on to look at the real problem. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, Danny? I think if people are living in the high rent apartments, and they're being guarded by uh, guards and cameras all over the building. They don't actually care what happens to the rest of the world. I mean, if they live and they're protected while they're sleeping and they don't go out, so yeah, they've got a good life. A rich victim. In other words, a victim who's paying a lot to be a victim, to be a potential victim. Uh, Evan? Well, a lot of people don't want to see this poem and, and ideas like this because they don't want to face the fact that our society could be falling just like the Roman Empire. Aha! Uh -huh. You see, and, and uh, others of you have said the same thing. Desiree? I was going to say that it's just like when the Olympics started, um, Americans don't want to admit that they have to do something to say, oh, somebody planned something, you can't accept the idea of them losing because we were committing all our lives and then it just suddenly went to decline so rapidly that it's affecting us. Excellent parallel, excellent parallel. John? Um, this reminds me of a movie I saw around.
interesting, again, we're not certain as to, it's whether, as to whether or not I really experienced it or not experienced it. Um, and that's very interesting because uh, ethnocentrism is one of the major reasons people fail to understand historical issues. I have another poem that was written, not by me, about 70 years ago. And it's a poem about this urban life also. But it's very different than the poem you read when the Roman legions left. I'd like you to listen to it. I don't have to reproduce because it will introduce something I want to talk about tomorrow. Vulgar of manners, overfed, underdressed, and underbred. Heartless, godless, hell's delight. Rude by day, and lewd by night. Be dwarf the man, or grown the brute, ruled by boss and prostitute. Raving, rotting, money mad, filled with avarice, lust, and rum, New York by names of Europe. How is this poem about New York, about urban life, different than the poem you read for Homer? Gina? All right, that's certainly one way. Evan, any ideas? No? Okay, look, I'll see you tomorrow. We'll take up on this. Thank you. Okay. Good night.